podcast Amsterdam. Good morning, Lana. We have two American guests today, so you're outnumbered. I know. As a Dutchie, I'm used to it. (laughs) Hello, guys. Hi. Hi. Sarah and Lauren from Launch Education Advisors. Welcome, you guys. So um, you're both American living in Hilversum, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, You made the long journey here. Yes, yeah, very long. <laughs> almost, long. almost on the same train as me because I also live in the burbs. But you had a hectic morning, right? Yeah, Lauren did. She had uh, some events. My husband was off work, so I was off kid duty. Oh, you were just so sipping your coffee, waiting. I got for out Lauren. of bed at eight a.m. What? Uh, That's like a luxury. I, I'm normal. But no, I had a busy morning. <laughs> yeah, you did. Busy morning. Forgotten gym clothes. Uh, I wrestled a oh. toddler to put a jacket on. But we're <laughs> that here. usual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're here. We're here. Because you guys both have two kids, right? Yeah. Yep. I have a 10-year-old. Or, oh, my gosh. That's you, Sarah. You have a I have a 10-year-old. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Are you? Are you we're with each other's kids Sometimes so much we that we've just kind of adopted yeah. each other's we, kids. Yeah. Oh, they're like work wives, yeah, like us. That's we are. Nice. Like a double date right Aww. now. Yeah. Sweet. Well, Thank we actually you. laugh because we say that I am like her husband, and she is really similar to my husband. So that's why our friendship works because we're yeah. like similar compliments to each other. Absolutely. Oh, that's uh, funny. I don't really think that applies to us. I feel like I'm the husband. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll just throw that yes. out there. You're more more the feminine. I'm more of the raw dutchy. <laughs> Let's just call it that. Yeah, I think my um, voice goes deeper while I'm talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> you do have a deep voice. Um, no, that's that's really great to have you guys here. And um, I think that we kind of met right. each other almost via the American Women's Club a little bit. Maybe. We run in the same circles. We run in the same circles, but I kind of like just we connected. Were orbiting around each other yeah. on planets for a while. I Not think that's quite true. interacting. Yeah. And now we've yeah. collided. Now we collided. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, I like it's your sound effects. In. You can record that later. Yeah, I'm going to for a little uh, <laughs> new jingle. New jingle. <laughs> Hello world. <laughs> <laughs> Explode it. Don't ask me to do any sound effects. I'm not good at that. Oh, now we will. Now no. we will, for sure. <laughs> I'm not so good. But um, so you guys are living in Hilversum, and um, you guys have lunch. How, how did that start? I mean, I uh, tell me more about your background. Okay, so I, for a few, when I first moved here, I didn't speak Dutch, and I didn't have any qualifications for anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> first, first word. <laughs> being honest. Yeah, we like that. So my first uh, order of business was to learn Dutch. So I moved here in 2010, was fluent by 2012, and then I started going back to school to get my teaching qualifications because that was always part of my plan. In the U.S., I wanted to be a math teacher, but not speaking Dutch natively, not great for a math teacher here. Um, And even... Back at that point, there were not so many international or or bilingual schools. So now that probably wouldn't be as much of an issue. But anyway, I switched to being an English teacher. I taught for a few years while I I studied and um, figured out that it was not for me. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Don't you love that later in life? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's why I've kind of gone private and, like, switched modes so I can still work with kids and help them out, help them achieve their dreams and everything. All the stuff that I do like. Mm-hmm. Without the stuff you don't like. Exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then enter uh, Lauren. Lauren. Enter Lauren. Yeah. Um, I moved here in 2017 for my husband's job and kind of left behind a whole career path that I was really, really happy in in the U.S. I was working in competitive preparatory school admissions and recruiting and I had spent almost 10 years in higher education doing the same thing. Um, And so when I got here, I realized that there was a huge gap for the expat and international families in terms of really good guidance for post-secondary options. Mm -hmm. So I toyed with it for about a year and then decided this was the right time to kind of just take a dive in and, and start my own business. And Sarah and I had met each other almost, I think, like eight, nine months at that point. We had known each other. Yeah, we met each other like last summer. 
Oh wow. Yeah. Mm. It's like oh, similar. similar. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. we were like, we just got along so well in our values and kind of outlook about helping students really aligned. And I think it just really gave both of us the confidence to say like, okay, we can take this risk and we know it's going to be, it's going to be really good, not just for us, but for so many other people. Okay. okay. Well, that's, and and then launch started. And then launch started amidst, I was supposed to have an internet outage for an hour it was when I was building out our website, and it lasted three weeks. Oh. oh. Yeah, and so I used spent my... spent a lot of time in cafes. A lot of time wow. in cafes oh, or using no. my, my cell phone as a hot spot in, oh, my, no. in my living room. Oh, wow. <laughs> but we survived, and we're here. See? Hilversum. I know. Hilversum, yeah. I know. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> so tell me, once again, you have this perfectly thought out description of what exactly is launch. What exactly does launch do? Do you want to say it, Sarah? Or you want no, to? you're you're much more rehearsed at it. You've got it down pat. <laughs> okay. So Launch is a boutique educational guidance company that provides ethical advice and guidance and coaching for secondary school students and families into their post-secondary school options. Wow. Oh, perfect. That's... I think it's really clear, though. It's nice that yeah. you have that, you know, just... See, sometimes out, my communications out. background yeah. is useful. It is, yeah. it is. We should Every definitely get deeper into that for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm taking notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, awesome. Yeah. Well, after, after this, we're going to talk a bit more about what exactly does that mean. Yeah. Podcast Amsterdam. Okay, so we want to talk a bit more about your services and yeah. the process you go through to help students choose the right university. Yeah. So, like, because um, we were talking a little bit before, and you said the earlier to start, the better. And then yeah. you said, like, age 14. That's super young. Yeah. Explain. Yeah. So, we like to, we'd ideally like to start with clients around age 14, which is MYP4, Fabio 3, um, HAVO 2, yeah. because HAVO and Fabio finish at different times. So, mm-hmm. we like to start, you know, graduation minus four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because yeah, because then you're we're getting to the kids before they choose their profiles. Because whenever uh, the high school students here have to choose either their DP program or their Dutch profile at school, um, they are actually shutting some doors to some programs that they might have otherwise found interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when they come to us after they've already chosen their DP profiles, we kind of have to work with what we have, which we can do, and it's fine. But um, getting them beforehand would be helpful uh, to make sure they have all of their options that they'd like. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems so young. but It is young. But, you know, I was saying that I was just visiting primary schools for my kids. They're two and a half. And it feels so early to choose the school that they'll stay at until they're 10, 11. Mm. And in Holland, then there's 12, also – yeah. Yeah. At 12, basically, they like – choose their future, you know. Yeah. It's really early. And then hoping they get to the right school because mm-hmm. there's like a waiting list in Amsterdam. So exactly. it's all just sort of like a guessing game. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it feels a bit different. But I mean, I was wondering if you guys are advising more kids who go to Dutch schools or international schools or a bit of both? Most of our clients right now are coming from international schools. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just because of the nature of third culture kids traveling yeah. globally and living in multiple countries and kind of the education that they're used to receiving. Um, so there is kind of a gap there that we really believe we can fill. And we never want to replace the counselors at international schools mm-hmm. because yeah. they play an amazing, amazing role in those students' lives. But there's always students who might need a little, a little more help. And that's what we're here for. Um, but we are getting some more inquiries from Dutch families who maybe have students at international school or we have actually families that are American, but their children have gone to Dutch school. Since right. They yeah, were it's not 11. really a normal thing here in Holland, right, yeah. to go to a guidance counselor kind of thing or someone who will. Well, no, because the Dutch process is actually really straightforward. The universities, they all list their qualification mm-hmm. requirements on their website so it's all very transparent and for most programs it's just like okay well if we can't fit everybody then it's just a lottery system so it's very straightforward it doesn't take a lot of time or training 
But um, why we help the international kids going to Dutch universities is because sometimes those IB qualifications are different or, um, you know, not all programs are offered in English. So if you have Mm. a kid who only wants to study in English, Mm -hmm. you really have to pay attention to, okay, what are the programs that are offered in English um, and what are the qualifications for those? Right. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. So that's definitely something to consider uh, when they're selecting a school. But what are other things that people need to consider when they're looking at schools in various countries, actually? Yeah, I think one of the big ones that we always talk about with families is what kind of financial contribution mm. are you going to be making to your education and how are you planning to fund that education? Because if you're relying, say you're an American family and you're relying on the free application for student aid, otherwise known as the FAFSA, you're really not going to qualify for a ton of money to be able to cover all expenses. Mm -hmm. Um, So we want families to really take that financial aspect into consideration. Yeah, because do you help them with getting a grant and all that stuff too? Yeah, like we really walk families through that whole process of financial aid and help them understand their financial aid letters and things like that. That's good to know. So it's not just because they won't get they won't know how much money they're gonna receive from each college until they've applied and been accepted and get a financial offer. Exactly. So that's something we help families with is be able to compare like, okay, these are your financial offers at all of these different colleges. Um, What does this all entail for you guys? And how much is this actually going to be out of pocket every year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's I can like imagine brokering for for universities. <laughs> yeah, man. it really is because I can imagine that there are quite different costs when yep. it comes to universities yeah. in various cities, various countries. Yep. So, what are the main differences that you see either within the countries or across the board? Um, within the U.S., you have a lot of universities that will offer scholarships regardless if you're a domestic or international student. There's some that you won't qualify for any need-based aid. In the UK, the scholarship amounts aren't as high. Um, Some countries don't even give scholarships whatsoever. So you're relying on student grants and loans and Hmm. things like that. Wow. So it really varies per university. And so you have to dig into every policy, every financial aid policy. Yeah. And like for an American going to university in the Netherlands, not all universities will accept uh, federal student loans. Oh. So There's that's only something. only five in the Netherlands that accept the free application for student aid. Okay. So if you think, oh, well, I can use my U.S. federal loan money, it's like, well, maybe. Maybe not. It depends. It, yeah, it yeah depends. you said that's that. That's kind of our motto. That's your motto. It depends. Hmm. Wow. I had no idea. It's a lot. We were also saying, I mean, that the the process has changed a lot as well in the last... 10, 20, 30 years, and sometimes yeah. parents, they still have in their head yeah, we really, how it was when they went to school. Absolutely. And we advise families to kind of throw out any preconceived notions that they had about a university or where that university is ranked because so much is changing so mm-hmm. quickly. So we really just want people to come into this process with a very open mind and yeah. willing to explore opportunities. So, anyway, going back to some misconceptions about applying for university in today's world, (laughs) as compared to even a couple couple years ago. 1950s. Yeah, I I can imagine that there's, you know, misconceptions from the parent side and also the student side. So what are some of the things that you see most commonly that people have in their head, but it's maybe not really the way it is? I think one of the big ones is, oh, I'm international or I have all this international living experience that I'll be able to get into one of the top 10 or 12 universities in America. Oh, yeah. Um, And that's just simply not the case. Admissions rates are going – are decreasing year over year, and you really have to be an absolute standout not just with your grades and test scores, but your extracurriculars, your essays, your teacher and counselor recommendations if you want to go to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, other and go co- to one of those top 10 absolutely. kind of schools. Um, so what's the acceptance rate? I like to – so it's not an Ivy League, but I like to use uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a good example. Um, their overall acceptance rate is 6%, but if you're applying as a – Non-U.S. student, so any inter- any other nationality besides American, 
um, you're looking at a 2% acceptance rate. So Oof. it's three times yeah. harder to get in as an international student than it is yeah. domestic. So Sheesh. you're not really that special. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, expat no. life. Everyone's doing it. Yeah, That's exactly. True. Yeah. 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 No, it's not so unique anymore. No. Wow. No, hmm. it's okay. definitely not. A, Actually, that makes you super special. <laughs> you well, if you, get in. if you get in, you must be extremely special. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, it's really small percentage. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. Absolutely. But, I mean, there's way there are so many more ways to be successful than just to get that stamp of MIT approval, right. you know, which is kind what, of an what, old what, school way of thinking. Yeah, because what can you do to, like, really prepare for, for all these applications? Because in Holland, we don't really have that out-school curriculum kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, so... We really um, – we have to focus on the kids getting their extracurricular activities and really um, showing their interest in a diverse um, yeah, set of activities. So if you're volunteering somewhere or if you are in a club or if you start a club at your high school, um, those kind of things go a long way to because the U.S. system really wants to see who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. That's – yeah, they call it the I holistic like admissions yeah. process. It's very well, deep. Yeah. In theory, it sounds great, but it just means that you have to achieve really well on multiple fronts to be able to compete. So that's why, like, these super competitive schools, you have to be, like, an all-star, not just at school. Right. But you have to, like, I don't know, have started your own charity or, <laughs> what? or like, I mean, own a business while you're wow. in school. Or like All if at we the think age about of it, 16. Kids, yes. kids now, like, okay, they're competing with Greta Thornburg to get into That's true. <laughs> don't mention into her. Harvard. <laughs> I mean, that's who their competition is. And we don't yeah. really know if Greta's applying there. We really don't know. <laughs> we, we haven't spoken to her. Greta, if you're listening, we're willing to help. Exactly. <laughs> oh I think God. she needs a little PR help. At but the you moment, got this, girl. Thing. You got it. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's a much more competitive environment, and it's become that way even within schools in the UK, especially in the the group that includes University of Edinburgh and University of College London, St Andrews, um, Oxford, and Cambridge. Mm, um, the old, the old good ones. Yeah, yeah, and it just it's it's a lot of information for people to wrap their minds around. And you yeah. also had mentioned when we were talking earlier that sometimes people. <clears throat> parents care a lot about the brand of the school, right? Yeah, and you know, I think it's a lot of marketing. Some universities do a great job of marketing their brand, and others do not, but there's some really amazing, life-changing places for students. Like one school that people don't think about, um, if you want to go on to get a master's or PhD in biology, and you want to get your hands on research, you need to look at Rhodes College in Tennessee, because, oh, yeah, so Where? super <laughs> random, right? Random. But like 5% of PhDs in bio have their undergrad from Rhodes. Oh. That's huge. That's yeah. like a huge, per- and I know it doesn't seem like a high percentage, but when you look at the percentages overall, it's massive. Wow, you have quite the wealth of random facts. I need to know oh. more. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm, and again, I'm a high school dropout, so I have no idea. But maybe. Someday you can go to Rhodes College and study biology. Maybe. The chances of that are the data will have a warm, nice summer in Holland. <laughs> but we no, uh, but global warming. That might be sooner than you think. Thanks. Okay. Okay. We'll but make seriously, a where, where can I find more stuff? I want to know more. Where, where can I find it? Um, you can definitely find us online at www.launcheducationadvisors.com. And it's advisors with an O. Not an E. Don't O-R-S. Don't O-R-S. Yeah. O-R-S. Yes. 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 Mm. And you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at launchedu. Cool. And Twitter is launchedad. Okay. We're E-D-A-D. gonna we're gonna write some things ad. under the pictures okay. for sure. We will uh, write this down, especially including the advisors yes. part. Yes. <laughs> confusing. <laughs> it could be confusing. Yeah, that's great. And um, you guys sometimes give workshops, right? We do. Um, we're still in the planning stages for kind of the next three or four months of when we're going to be doing some more workshops, but we are working on it. Um, and we always encourage families. We offer a free sixty minute consultation. Um, so they can kind of figure out if it's going to be a good fit for them or not. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It was so much fun. 